Good afternoon. We're going into special counsel. We have uh, two items under our strategic session, and then uh, we'll have our in-camera authorization. So with that, I will turn it over to Mr. Regeer for the first item. Welcome, Rod. Uh, thank you, uh, Mayor Verbanovich. Um, I, uh, I'd like to take council back to um, early 2011. It was the first uh, six months of the new term of, uh, of a new council. Uh, a majority of, uh, of you had uh, just been elected and uh, in economic development, we wanted to start a conversation with you about the future economic development strategy for the city. Um, <clears throat> and so we started uh, the development process that led to KEDS.11, uh, uh, a, uh, a, uh, a new approach to economic development for the city of Kitchener. Um, Jenna is gonna, gonna talk about that process up very briefly and then introduce a process that like, we'd like to start with you now uh, in the first term of your new, in the first six months of your new term. Uh, we're interested in uh, refreshing the economic development strategy again. It's, uh, we've, uh, we've had four years of experience. Our, our city has evolved. The economy as a whole has evolved. Technology has evolved. Um, global markets has, have evolved. So we think it's timely to, uh, to take a, a breath and, and refresh our thinking on how uh, we position our economy to succeed over the next four years. Um, so this, this discussion with you today is to, uh, is to uh, introduce you to the concept of uh, the process that we're proposing to work through, uh, to get your feedback, uh, some of your ideas about how to uh, strengthen that process, and, um, and then seek your direction to, uh, to launch the strategy development uh, uh, together with our stakeholders, uh, with council and with staff. So uh, with that, I'm going to hand it over to Jeanette. She's going to walk through uh, an introductory presentation for you. Okay, just hang on one sec. I think we have a question for you already. Okay. Councillor Ioannidis. Are, are you seeking for direction for today? Because what I look on the report, it just says for information purposes. Yeah, it's, uh, it's primarily for information, but we're interested in your feedback about primarily about process and okay. way to strengthen the process. We are interested in engaging you as councillors in the process. Jeanette will get into that uh, okay. in a little bit of detail and, and then we can have an exchange of ideas about how to do that. Okay, thanks Rob. Okay, great. Welcome Jeanette. Thank you. <clears throat> so I'm actually going to start by taking you back to 2007 and our economic <clears throat> development strategy that we created then to guide that four-year period up until 2011 actually laid the foundation for where we are today. And we identified then areas of focus that remain relevant, including growing small business, building a dynamic downtown, and attracting and retaining talent. Where things really um, shifted in KEDS 2011 was around our thinking about when and where we get involved in job creation, and about creating an environment that inspires innovation, creativity, and really fuels job growth. So looking back at KEDS 2011, we had five areas of focus plus a commitment to manufacturing. You can see the first three areas of focus, Startup City, Leading Edge Cluster Building, and Become a Talent Magnet, really have citywide and, and regional implications. Dynamic Downtown and Innovation District, of course, are downtown focused, but again, have implications for the regional economy. So we have some highlights here, and it's our intention as we go through this process this year to look at our successes under KEDS 2011 in more depth and see what we can learn from the programming that we've had over the last four years. So some examples include the launch of the Startup Landing Pad program to help the startups graduating from the hub to find space in the downtown core, um, developing more competitive industrial development charges, uh, the support of the music cluster through Music Works, Something like the adaptive reuse of the Brighta block it was really important in terms of our talent space because it creates a really exciting and inspiring environment where our really innovative companies want to locate. As well, the Kitchener Studio Project demonstrates how our post-secondary um, universities and college come together on a project. The Downtown Action Plan has been a, a key um, part of developing our dynamic downtown. And one of our major successes in the Innovation District was obtaining provincial support for two-way all-day GO train service, which will really help fuel the, the growth and the considerable momentum we already have in that area. 
So we have had four-year lifespans for economic development strategies, but we did feel that it was important this time around, as always, to ask the question, do we in fact need to update KEDS? So we went to our advisory committees back in the fall and asked this uh, question and had a conversation about it. We identified that, as always, there's changing economic context or climate that we need to consider when we refresh our strategy. And as well, we need to look at what worked from KEDS 2011 and what our challenges are moving forward. There's some specific um, factors that need to be considered this time around, including um, arts and culture and special events were not part of economic development when we created KEDS 2011. So those groups moved into economic development and certainly they supported the work that we were doing under KEDS, but they weren't involved in the creation of the strategy from the ground up. So we see an opportunity there to really fully integrate those divisions into our group. As well, since 2011, the um, Economic Development Investment Fund, EDIF, has concluded. So we need to turn our attention to the Economic Development Reserve Fund to consider how we spend and replenish that fund. As well, the Waterloo Region Economic Development Strategy and the formation of the supporting corporation to implement that strategy will be factors that we need to consider in the coming years. And finally, we have a refreshed corporate strategic plan and a new term of council. So looking at some of those items in more detail, we need to understand the fit of KEDS into to the other pieces of the puzzle. So the corporate strategic planning process is underway right now, and the economy was identified as a community priority for the next four years. The regional economic development strategy, and specifically the action plan that accompanies that, identifies certain areas where the municipalities are expected to take a leadership role or a supporting role. So we feel that it's important at this point in time to look at that detailed action plan and identify our role in KEDS in supporting REDS. Underneath KEDS, we have a couple of supporting strategies already. So the Downtown Action Plan and the Waterloo Region Small Business Centre has a strategy as well. The Kitchener Market and Arts and Culture groups are currently working on developing strategies, and we are proposing that we develop a special events and urban vitality strategy, as well as a business development action plan. So we wanted KEDS to be a very flexible and responsive strategy to allow us to react to changing economic circumstances. We would hope then that these divisional strategies or action plans would be more tactical in approach, um, and get into more specifics about how we deliver programming and services. So the feedback that we had from our Economic Development Advisory Committee, Downtown Action and Advisory Committee include, um, generally they didn't want to see a shift in direction. They felt that we had a lot of positive momentum and that we just needed to refresh our strategy. They also felt it was very important to look back at what had been accomplished in the last four years so that we could understand what worked, um, and to ensure that KEDS is aligned with REDS to really amplify the impact of both strategies. They also identified a need to um, develop a marketing and communication strategy and supporting materials to accompany KEDS. KEDS is a standalone document and it was a very effective document, but we feel that it would have a greater impact if we had other um, materials and a communication strategy to support it. And finally, the advisory committees again identified that community engagement is a really important part of this process. So we'll turn our attention now to the process that we're recommending that we move forward with this year. Our, our process has been based around the idea of idea generation and bringing together our stakeholders. We don't want to duplicate the broad public consultations that took place as part of the corporate strategic planning process. And there were also extensive consultations that went into the formation of the regional economic development strategy. So we try to bring together our stakeholders to be part of the conversation. So we are identifying four tactics that we'd like to move forward on, including something new called 150 Conversations, the 150 Ideas Symposium, which we did have last time, uh, continuing our advisory committee conversations and as well a staff workshop. So I'll go into a little bit more detail on each of those now. So 150 conversations is new and this is inspired by something called 1000 dinners. So in the city of Toronto they launched a community engagement program where they encouraged members of the community 
to register to host their own dinner and conversation and provide feedback then to the city on the results of that conversation. So we liked this model because it really empowers community groups to have their own conversation on their own topic of interest and feed that back to us. However, we recognize that there may be partners or stakeholders or group that actually want to have a two-way conversation. So we see that this particular approach, 150 conversations, could be made up really of you know, independent citizen-led conversations as well as staff or council-led conversations that would all feed into the, the final product. So this is something that in particular we wanted to discuss with council in more detail. Um, but if I could, I'll elaborate on the rest of the consultation process, and then we can return to this. So the 150 Ideas Symposium got its name from the, um, the structure of the event. So we invited 150 people to come together in the tannery space, and they met for 150 minutes. We assigned them to tables, and we gave each table a topic. So it could be downtown residential development, local food, manufacturing. And each conversation was facilitated, and we challenged them to come up with 150 ideas. I think we got three or 400 ideas out of that event, but probably more important even than the idea generation was the excitement and energy that it um, brought to our group of stakeholders and really uh, mobilized people to support the economic development strategy. We have been participating in conversations with our advisory committees, and we would like to move forward with those through the spring. And we're recommending as well the formation of a subcommittee with representatives from the different economic development advisory committees, including EDAC, DAC, and ACAC. And the idea here is to engage that subcommittee over the summer months to vet the economic development strategy as we move forward and give us some early feedback to ensure that we're moving in the right direction. And finally, we're recommending that we have a staff workshop, which we did last time as well. We think that's especially important this time to look at the new economic development divisions and how they fit into our strategy, and as well, in particular, to address REDS and make sure that our programming as municipal staff and the direction that we're moving in aligns with the strategic direction of the region. In terms of deliverables, we have the final KEDS publication itself. But again, this time we are looking for more than just the physical publication, but a communication strategy, updated web content, and other supporting materials that will really help to reinforce a consistent message about the direction that we're going and the identity of uh, the Kitchener Economic Development Strategy. So I'm just going to walk you through now the timing for all of these components. So we started, and you'll see on the left side what was happening internally, and as well the um, external uh, focus is on the right side. So we started by asking the question, do we need to update KEDS? And this began back in September with our advisory committees and has been ongoing. And as well, we looked then at the results of the public consultation for the corporate strategic plan um, and had discussions among staff. We then asked the question, how in fact should we go about doing it? And we've been working on developing the process that we're bringing forward to you today, again with discussion with our advisory committees on that particular process. We're now entering into what I would call the discovery phase. And this is the point in the conversation where we need to identify what topics are relevant to our strategy, what stakeholders and groups we need to engage with. So this is where, for example, we would identify, and identified last time, that there was considerable momentum around local food. So this was something that we wanted to research. This is something we wanted to talk about. We wanted to make sure we had representatives of that community involved in our consultation. So internally, we create a discussion paper or a research paper to identify um, the issues or topics we want to pursue, and as well, looking for feedback from council and our advisory committees on areas that we want to develop. We then move forward with the actual consultation phase, which includes the staff workshop, as well as the 150 Ideas Symposium and the 150 Conversations. That takes place in April, May. So we'll be looking to wrap up all of our consultations by June and spend the summer months actually in the strategy formulation phase. 
So this is the point in time where we need to take all of the great ideas that we get and assess our capacity to implement them, whether or not, in fact, we have a mandate to implement them, and how well it fits with the current um, economic climate and environment that we're working in. We're targeting August then to return to our advisory committees for feedback, September to return to Committee of Council, and ultimately Council approval in October of 2015. So the discussion, uh, the whole process, of course, we'd like feedback on, but in particular, that 150 conversations piece is one where we would like some direction from council with respect to what the role of council might be in that process. So we see there's an opportunity here to connect with um, potentially neighborhood groups or associations. Would it make sense, for example, to counselor, for councillors to engage with their ward, or would it be more relevant to explore certain um, topics, i.e., um, you know, advanced manufacturing or development of a food cluster, finance and insurance. So we are looking at the way that we can drive the, the best um, source of information and really engage with our community most effectively. And as well then identifying stakeholder groups or uh, individuals to target for participation in our consultation and topics or issues or opportunities that need to be addressed as we move again into this discovery phase. So I uh, return then, Mr. Mayor, to you for discussion. Thank awesome. you. Awesome. Thanks a lot, Jeanette. Uh, great uh, piece of work done so far. We have several members of council with questions, and I know I have a few myself. Councillor Singh, you're first. Yeah, thank you, and Jeanette. Uh, thank you for that very clear process that staff have in mind in laying out uh, what will uh, go forward. So of that process, uh, looking back, reflecting back on, on the current KEDS strategy from 2011 to 2015, you had a slide which showed out some of the accomplishments and that what I want to connect to is that 150 idea symposium. So were there actionable items that came out of it that resulted into those successes that you laid out? Or did it go give it more of a general overview to our uh, economic development strategy? I think that one of the really interesting ideas that came out of that probably was one of the areas of focus, which was the innovation district, which was distinct from our previous economic development strategy. So we knew that you know talent attraction and retention, you know that was already an area of focus for us. Um, but we identified specific opportunities that were associated with each of those areas of focus that were inspired by um, suggestions that were put forward at that event. Okay, and the, the look and feel of that symposium was quite different than what staff have in mind right now. From what I remember, it was a lot of key stakeholders in the community from development and, and large and medium-sized, small-sized businesses as well. So we were get really hearing from the business community as to what was needed. Uh, what I see now is more of an overall community dialogue engagement, not to say that's bad. I, I support it quite strongly. But Enveronix kind of served a purpose in um, prioritizing or receiving information back from the community saying that economic development is a strong priority in their mind. What will this conversation lead to, that staff in mind? Yes. Um... Our, our thought was that uh, the symposium would actually look quite a lot the same, well, qu quite similar to what we had done last, last time, but we wanted to broaden the conversation to include other stakeholders across the city. Um, you know, uh, for us, it's, it's difficult to uh, anticipate fully the kind of dialogue people would be interested in engaging in. Um, sometimes uh, it it's important for us to ask an open-ended question of our community to, to, to see what the scope of the response is. Um, we do know it's a priority and uh, that economic development is, and job creation is something that people feel very strongly about. And so that's where my question was. Yeah. Uh, our initial economic development our CAD strategy yeah. was industry-led and directed. Yeah. And this is more community-led and directed. Could this diverge to the things? And has enough time passed for us to really focus on that between the 2011 and 2015? Yeah. Well, our, our Economic Development Advisory Committee and Downtown Advisory Committee s said very strongly that they feel that they, want, they, they would be disappointed if we, if, we, if we diverged too much from the current path. The current path is clearly having a profound effect. Uh, it's working in the, in the city, in the city's interest. So um, 
but I think that there are many questions about how we can how we can uh, strengthen, how we can enrich it, enrich the current process, and also what new projects we can use to advance, for example, startup city as a concept, or uh, how we can advance further or support further the manufacturing cluster. Will there be a component where we will still go back and and do those asks from our business community and our development community and saying how well have we done? What have we done well? What, what needs to uh, receive more attention at? Will that be a component of this? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And that's actually the primary focus for the symposium. Okay, great. Yeah. Thank you. Councillor Davey. Thank you, Mayor Verbenovich. Uh, thanks for the presentation, Jeanette. Uh, I th think it, it might be advantageous to just step back for a minute and get, uh, I know you do a lot of work in terms of uh, unemployment numbers and statistics um, of our area. I think it might be helpful when we're looking at the degree to which we change uh, the strategy going forward, if you could give us a brief overview of how, um, how our area of Ontario is doing, how um, our Kitchener, Waterloo, Cambridge are doing in terms of unemployment, participation rate, that sort of thing, um, so we know to what degree we need to uh, make some changes. Okay. Um, the latest labor force survey numbers did come out on Friday, and at this point in time, Statistics Canada provides um, a, they provide an annual set of revisions, and they revise data back many years. So we have new data now from 2001 onward. So this past month, our employment rate was the third highest in the country. Our participation rate was the second highest in the country, and our unemployment rate sat at 5.7%. Statistics Canada revised the previous month's unemployment rate to 5.8%, so our unemployment did fall this month. So just to put that employment rate in context, it's roughly, um, I can tell you exactly, it is 69.3%. Hamilton has an employment rate that's about 10 percentage points lower than ours. So what this means is, um, if you take the working age population, we have significantly more of our working age population employed in this community. So if Hamilton had Kitchener-Cambridge Waterloo's employment rate, they would add another 60,000 roughly to their employment base in that community. So it's really those employment numbers that we turn to when we're trying to understand our economic situation. Um, we've added... 11,300 jobs over the last five months. So we're on a five, five consecutive months of employment growth. And over the last five years, we've added more jobs than any other metropolitan area in Ontario, except for Toronto, which is added more by virtue of simply being a much bigger economy. So when we look at the kind of growth that we've had over the last four to five years, there's been some pretty substantial changes in our local economy. And there's been some, in particular, positive results in manufacturing, where we saw a stabilization of our manufacturing numbers and then growth, in fact. The bulk of the jobs that we lost in manufacturing were lost prior to the recession. So that economic context is something that we would expand on in the research or discussion paper that frames our consultations. So we want people to understand what our employment situation actually is, um, what industries we're seeing changes in, where there's growth, where there's areas of concern that perhaps need some extra attention. Okay, thank you. I think I'm glad you actually had that information handy because I think it's important with the... So what you're saying then is even with the backdrop out there of issues at Blackberry and Maple Leaf, et cetera, uh, still top of mind, the reality is uh, our area is doing not only well, but phenomenally well. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Councillor Fernandez, you're up next. Thank you. Um, interesting figures. Um, so you, you met with a couple of um, our advisory committees, but um, have you met with our advisory committee like Heritage? and arts and culture and um, cycling. I mean, all of those environment, all of them would have, to me, some stake in how um, our city grows and how our city changes. Uh, have we met with them as well? We, uh, the, the three um, advisory committees that Economic Development has uh, refers to are uh, the Economic Development Advisory Committee, Downtown Advisory Committee, and the Arts and Culture Advisory Committee. So those are the three that we rely on for our um, 
uh, our direction and our feedback on, on strategy development. Um, but there's, uh, there's, there's no doubt that the, that the process that we're outlining here to move forward with has got lots of opportunity for other advisory committees and, and, and advocates of other uh, uh, sectors, for example, uh, in, um, cycling and, uh, and um, uh, heritage to become involved. I could add to that. Last time we did invite all of the advisory committees to participate in the symposium. And in particular, where there was an interest, then we did connect with um, the advisory committees and come to their meetings. So um, I recall going to meet with the, uh, the name escapes me, but the youth. Um, uh, Kayak. Thank you, yes. And had a specific conversation with that group because we felt it was really important to have the perspective of youth um, as talent attraction and development is an important part of our work. Okay. It's just that I, I, I'm concerned that we are looking at it from only a business perspective um, and, and not looking at, at a holistic approach. Because if we're talking, again, it seems we are focusing on economic development within the downtown core area. Um, are we working towards a, another EDIF? Is that where this is leading to? Uh, no, I don't think it is. We we have a uh, an economic development reserve, and I think uh, as part of this conversation, we can have a, a discussion about uh, the future of the reserve and how we might use it and leverage it to achieve our economic development objectives as a as a community. Um, if uh, if other members of the community uh, or council of our stakeholders are are interested in putting an EDIF concept on the table, then uh, then we'll take it as information and bring it back to council for for discussion. Okay. Um, essentially, does this boil down to marketing the marketing of Kitchener? I mean, the the, the document, the publication that we had the last time was was a fairly uh, glossy, f fancy production, um, and I'm sure it was handed out um, in a wide variety of areas. So is this, it really is this basically just saying we want to market the city of Kitchener and how we want to, to, want to in, increase attention? I, I would say uh, that, that an economic development strategy needs to articulate the city's vision for its economy. and. Um, the story, the, the 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 method by which we propose to um, to achieve that vision. Um, there's no doubt that an economy is uh, is a massive thing. It's um, it's a thing which uh, goes well beyond the powers of a municipality to affect. Um, you know, there are millions of transactions in the city every day, and uh, the evolution of the economy is something which we can only. Uh, nudge in particular directions, and it changes like the direction of a super tanker over time. Um, it's absolutely vital that we find ways of, mobil of mobilizing our, the, the resources of our partners. Um, we simply couldn't have achieved what we achieved over the last four years or the last ten years without uh, the resources of people from the private sector, other institutions, other levels of government investing in the vision that we had articulated and the best way to to um, what we've what we found is that the best way to mobilize other people's investment in in our project is to create a vision which is dynamic and uh, compelling um, so that's uh, that's the extent to which uh, it's a it's a marketing uh, project uh, clearly we need to be effective communicators about that vision to uh, to help make it happen Okay. Um, is there, I mean, I know that we're working towards the whole, and we'll be hearing about it again tonight at Council, the Waterloo Regional Economic Development um, strategy. Are we not duplicating some of the same efforts? No. Uh, this, is, this process is designed entirely to interlock and to, and to complement and support the, uh, the work at a regional level. Um, if you think about each of the cities in the Waterloo region, um, we each have uh, complementary uh, strengths. Uh, we are very different places. We have uh, different uh, tools to, to work with, uh, different resources to work with. And the economic development strategy at a regional level is meant to, uh, to, to, 
to integrate and to ha strengthen and harmonize uh, those, uh, those strategies. But it, that strategy, the regional economic development strategy, recognizes that there are functions within economic development, there are, there are uh, aspects of economic development which are best done at the local level and which are best done by by partners at, at, at the local level. So um, this, this effort here is really designed to make sure that our work as a city uh, is complementary to the, and supportive of the, uh, of the regional strategy. Can you give me anything, is, um, am I done? Yeah, so. We, I'll come back. Okay, thank you. Councillor Ioannidis. Whoops, sorry, turning on. There you go, go ahead. Thank you, through you, Mayor's there. I mean, uh, Mayor Vrbanovich. Sorry about that. It's okay. Um, we forgive for six, the first six months. Six months. Um, one of the, the processes that I wouldn't mind seeing is, and I think there may be a, a, this would be a good opportunity, is, is to go around, uh, around the community centers and, and, uh, and gather some input from some of the residents there because I think sometimes it's a good idea to, to hear some input from individuals that are not so close to everything and maybe we'll be able to hear a fresh perspective and uh, and who knows maybe we'll find a good 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 suggestion there that we never thought of and maybe some others never thought of so I think that's one of the routes that we, sh we could look at in broadening discussion um, one of the other things I wouldn't mind looking at too and and seeing is is seeing our website presence I think uh, if you look at other municipalities um, throughout Canada and, 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 th and through the states, their websites are, they have specific needs when it comes to economic development and, and uh, I think we need to broaden that as well and, and have it more of a little user friendly and, and out there so that when, when someone is looking at creating a, a business or wanting to come to the community and move their company here that it's, a little, it's more accessible but more detail and, and, and straightforward kind of thing and right now I don't think we have that presence right right now so I think it's important that we focus in that aspect um, another thing that we should I think we should look at too is um, maybe not today I mean but early maybe later on in this in this new CAD strategy that we look at forming a retail a retail uh, I guess a solution for looking at some of our retail Understanding, I know that retail is a tertiary market and that doesn't really develop until afterwards, but I think it's still important that we keep an eye on that. Um, another thing that I would like to see is um, it's great that we could have a, a good website and it's great that we, we could be sitting at our computers, but uh, that's not going to get the type of businesses that we want to come to this community. And I think, I think uh, lead generation is important for us to look forward to because... It's, let's just face it, no one's going to come to us and say, let's, uh, we want to open up a business here. We have to be out in the community. We have to go globally and look and search for these businesses to come here because it's a globally market. It's very competitive. Um, and another area, too, that I, I would like to look at, too, is I think we need to get a little more into a niche mark, niche area of economic development. When I consider that niche, I'm saying like new, new media, what's resulting with film, uh, music, in the digital digital media as well, because if you look at the dollars, how much that attracts overall annually, it's in the trillions. So that's an important market that I think we need to focus on. Um, and I guess, last but not least, I know I've given you guys a lot of suggestions. Um, just uh, with with Reds in the, in that, I think we need to get a better understanding out there why it's not a duplication between what we do and what what REDS is doing because really if, if you think it's a duplication you don't understand what both organizations are doing so we need to get that out there so people can understand that's not a duplication. Okay, thank you Councillor Arnettis. Councillor Ratherington. Yeah, through you Mr. Mayor, um, a couple of questions. Rod, how much money will Kitchener alone, not REDS, spend on economic development in 2015? Um, our uh, budget is approximately $3 million if you include the entire uh, portfolio of uh, economic development services. That's special events, arts and culture, kitchen market, um, uh, business development, small business center support to organizations. 
and then we have an additional fund which we use to uh, subsidize parking, uh, particularly in the downtown. And in 2014, how much that was there? Uh, Just it would roughly about two and a half percent less, I would say. Okay. And I don't have uh, it right off the top of my head, but yeah. How much is in your economic development reserve fund that's mentioned in this report? Well, I don't have the current balance. I haven't looked at it for some time. Um, I could say well, two million dollars. Is that fair? Well, I can get back to you on that one. For okay. Yeah. And yeah. ju just so I'm it, it would, yeah, as uh, Sorry. Uh, Dan has just indicated, it's in the budget package, so. Okay. Yep. Just so I'm clear on this, in, in the upcoming time period, this, the money you're spending on, in uh, your department, that is clearly over and above what is being proposed for REDS. Am I correct? That's correct. Yeah. And the, a question more at the local level, perhaps Jeanette can answer that. How do you intend, you mentioned neighborhood groups in here, how do you intend to uh, harness those groups or talk to those groups? That's part of the process that we're working through right now. We see that we can have our communications team play a supporting role and we've engaged them already to have a conversation about how we can um, promote this consultation process and get attention for what we're doing using social media. Um, but as well, we'd like to build on the um, connections that we have or um, forge new relationships. So if we can identify, for example, that there's a specific group that we think that we should be connecting with, this provides an opportunity to make that connection and, and start building that relationship with that group. Um, and encourage them either to engage in a conversation on their own or offer to facilitate a conversation to um, bring them into the process. And in that way, sometimes the, the process itself, it really elevates the importance of, of that um, and not just the end product because it does become about developing those relationships. Okay, and back to Rod. Rod, it's, been, it's come up several times already and I had the same concern. How do you avoid overlap and duplication with REDS? And maybe I think Councillor Fernandez was just about to ask if you could give me a couple of examples of what would be in one and what would be funded in the other. Sure, sure. Um, <clears throat> uh, the regional economic development, Waterloo Region Economic Development Strategy is um, is a very is a very high level document and meant to um, advance the economy of the Waterloo Region as, as a whole. And in the in the uh, action planning uh, section of the of the of the plan, it identifies functions that are are really a municipal lead, and functions that are the Regional Economic Development Corporation lead. Um, functions which it sees as uh, being a, a local lead would would include, for example, downtown. Um, uh, revitalization, which it sees as primarily a local area uh, municipality um, priority, and where the local area municipalities have um, have strategic advantages. There are uh, cluster projects, uh, for example, and manufacturing, which uh, uh, might be um, uh, better facilitated, which are really clearly a regional stra uh, strategy, which. You know, as this new organization is put in place and develops capacity, uh, might choose to uh, to develop uh, a core focus in that uh, in that area. In which case, we might become more supporting players in that regard. Um, the development of local land resources would be a local area municipality responsibility. Uh, perhaps the development of regional uh, uh, land resources would be a, a higher level function. So. It's divided up in fairly detailed uh, fashion in that regard. Okay. And just one final question. Jeanette, the, I had a lot of trouble going wading through this report. just want to quote to your sense on 1E4 that says, the idea generation process benefits from the cross-pollination of perspectives made possible through the assembly of diverse stakeholders. 
Does that mean you get ideas by talking to different people? Yes, and specifically bringing together those different people with different perspectives and, and putting them in a situation where they exchange ideas. So when we planned out the symposium last time, um, we targeted um, stakeholders to invite to the event, and once we had a guest list, organized them into tables where we had really interesting combinations with people representing different sectors. So whether it was real estate or tourism or food or the startup community, investors, we wanted to have, um, again, different perspectives, different ideas all coming together and seeing what people can learn from one another and how their ideas might complement one another. Okay. No, I appreciate that. I understand that. Okay. I'm not being, it's a bit wordy. <laughs> not being a smart ass. It's just the... <laughs> I have trouble with the word. Thank you. Okay. Councillor Yonetsky. <clears throat> In the conclusion of the report, it talks about the shift from land development towards community development. And does that mean that there will be no more involvement from your department with land development now because the new regional uh, economic development has now been created? Or will there still be some liaison back and forth? The city is still managing its uh, its land uh, development process internally. Um, the, uh, the 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 supply of city owned uh, and city owned industrial land is relatively limited, and we will continue to build that out um, as uh, as market forces uh, allow us to. And of course, we have a portfolio of uh, of properties in the downtown which uh, we'll bring forward uh, with council to uh, uh, council direction to market over, over time. I think um, the, uh, the, the point in the report is, that, is simply that as the city moves closer to being in a full, fully built out state, we, our role will shift from, uh, from one of uh, where we, th we used to think of our, ourselves as, a, as land developers and, and needed to facilitate the development process uh, in that manner to, uh, to a uh, cluster-based economic development approach uh, where, where community capacity, community talent is, is the primary resource. So for the city-owned lands that you identified throughout the city as well as the downtown area, mm -hmm. will that promotion and trying to make something come of those lands just be done by you guys or will that also be transferred in any way to the new regional group to have them work on it as well or will it be both people working on it well right now um, we do rely on ctt to present um, our land portfolio particularly our employment land portfolio to uh, investors as uh, and buyers as they're as they come up in the market and as uh, as ctt is it comes forward with them but uh, we haven't divested ourselves of that. We're not proposing to do that as part of that, uh, the, the future strategy. I think um, the, at a regional level, the region has to deal with the question of its long-term employment land supply and uh, how it facilitates that over the 5, 10, and 20-year horizon. Uh, that's a completely different, uh, different uh, discussion. So... How much time, in terms of percentage, will you now be devoting to this new strategy versus your, your, your old stuff, or is that sort of hard to gauge at this point in time? Well, um, our, uh, our intent is to, is to uh, um, focus some effort now over the next six months to uh, build a new strategy, um, refresh our, our old strategy, if you will. Um, our Economic Development Advisory Committee has uh, recommended that it not be a fundamental shift that, it, uh, that we continue to move in, in, the, in the direction that we're moving in, but that we en enrich our strategy, develop new action, uh, um, new projects, new action plans, and that we refine the strategy. So all of the work that's been uh, undertaken up to this point in the last four years will continue. Uh, we will continue to implement uh, all the programs or projects under Startup City, for example, the Startup Landing Pad program. We'll continue to work on the Innovation District, support the two-way GO service, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, 
the, the strategy development process will be primarily, uh, it'll be a team effort, uh, but the people that are being assigned to uh, this work are uh, Jeanette and myself and, uh, and a few others as required to, to make it happen. You mentioned that uh, when a question was raised about how much money in the reserve and maybe $2 million was, 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 uh, was identified. Uh, how do you plan to use that money now that there's a change in, in direction? Well, I think that's, a, that's a, a, an excellent uh, question to, to put to the strategy. Um, the, the pool is uh, designed uh, to support capital investments uh, that the city uh, um, uh, advocates for, and, uh, and that's what we're, uh, we're continuing to, uh, to, to assume. Um, but I think the next, this strategy will help us uh, create a vision for how to leverage those funds, how to, how to utilize them effectively in order to create the, the, the opportunities that we aspire to in the next, uh, through this term of council and beyond. Interesting. Um, the 150 conversations comparing to the 1,000 dinners in Toronto Where's the, the 1,000 dinners in Toronto? Where is that at right now, and, uh, and how, how successful or not successful has that been from, I mean, you just mentioned that you're sort of duplicating that role or that uh, process. Where's that at, and, and has it been successful or not? we're investigating right now is trying to understand uh, if there's any lessons that we can learn from Toronto staff. So that's part of our process too. Um, we're still formulating this part of the uh, engagement plan, but we want to see if there's anything that we can learn from it. But it's the concept that we thought was um, an interesting idea to, to test out and see if we could implement in this community. So are they still in the early stages or have they now completed it? The, the project, the 1,000 Dinners project, was designed specifically to facilitate conversations, dinner table conversations, prior to the election. So it's, it was a time-limited exercise. I think it, was to, it took place in, uh, primarily in September um, of, uh, of last year. And, uh, and it created a, there was a, a kind of a template for, for individuals to host conversations uh, around a dinner uh, that they would uh, that they would facilitate, um, and uh, apparently it was a there were there was it was an extremely diverse offering. They had a, a strong support. I don't actually know any of the numbers of how many dinners were hosted, but it was uh, it was a significant number, and it was an interesting function. It's uh, been it's been practiced as an idea in uh, many of the large U.S. cities, uh, Chicago and. Uh, and New York and LA have had uh, 1,000 dinner projects in the past. Okay, thank you. Councillor Galloway Seelock. Yeah, I don't have any uh, questions, just feedback, because I think that that's what you've requested um, from us today. So um, I like the idea um, that you've kind of already brought forward that we reach out into the communities and into the neighborhoods. And I think one way of doing that um, is not um, with topic specific, because I don't think, I think people won't understand what they're going to give, but really that same concept of the, the, the symposium um, where you have facilitated brainstorming sessions. I think those work the best with community because you can just ask that broad question, but then you can, once you get them at the table, you can really dive down into what that means for, for each one of them. And I think one way to do that, you're talking about the 100 um, conversations, is if we can get 10 people from uh, each ward out to participate in the, these, t these sessions and maybe hold three or four sessions so they're not too large but you can have smaller groups and that between um, council we can help you um, identify some of those 10 people. I hesitate to just continue to go to neighborhood associations because we ask them for a lot but there may be you know a key person from a neighborhood association that council members could pull in and ask um, them to participate but also reach out to the community through our social media networks and our columns um, to really ask that we get 10 people which I don't think is too much to ask um, to come out and, and participate in these discussions. Um, it may also be if, if councillors themselves can't come up with the 10, <coughs> that uh, the district facilitators or the community resource centre staff would also be able to help people, uh, identify people in, in those areas to um, participate in those discussions. I think there does need to also be the topic specific 
um, sessions, but I don't think that, I think you need to go more towards um, some of the community leaders and the business people for those types of, of sessions. I, I, I really believe um, with the community that broader focus is, is more important and then if you're diving down into a few ideas, have a couple specific meetings with targeted, uh, targeted people, but I think we still do need to engage them as well, the community leaders and the business leaders that we've, we've not necessarily the same ones, but so that that's that group that we need to engage in this because it really does need to be um, holistic. Um, yeah, and I think that's my feedback. I really do agree that we need to go and focus more citywide and, and get that input citywide. So um, I'm willing to help in any way, trying to get people at those at that table to help discuss this further. Okay, thank you, Councillor Gazola. I find this very interesting, uh, all this talk we have about the great city of Toronto and it's a thousand ideas. I haven't spent the last three days there. They, they can't figure out how to remove uh, two centimeters of snow, so economic development. And that leads me to my, to my question. The area that I represent, uh, we, uh, I never have a lot of discussions on economic development. That, that uh, uh, I'm hearing that that's of uh, main emphasis with a lot of people, but the discussions I have with many people de deal with more mundane issues like removing snow and cutting grass and what have you. And because of that, I'd like if you could uh, tell me, uh, if you could give me four examples of what this program has accomplished in the past four years. Four things that, uh, four big economic development factors so that, uh, and things that the average person on the street would understand and say, yeah, okay, I, I, I see that. that. That was something that changed my life. So what, 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 what have we really accomplished in the last four years? Four examples. We've, had, we've got 300 of them. So just give me four. Uh, I think that one of the most important examples was the, um, the success in rallying uh, provincial support for two-way go service. I think that's going to ultimately have a profound uh, effect on our ability to compete uh, in, uh, in global markets. Um, we've seen uh, the identification of, uh, of, uh, of the city as a uh, startup and technology um, economy, uh, uh, essentially a new brand for the identity of the city. Uh, um, we've seen startups congregating in the downtown, uh, creating jobs uh, in the creative sector, well-paying jobs uh, for people that live across the city and uh, beyond. Uh, we've seen, um, uh, you know, it's, a, it's obviously a related factor, uh, but I think the articulation of the vision for the innovation district um, created the, uh, the, the momentum to, uh, to, to have Google decide to locate in the downtown with a major expansion. Um, I think those are... That's three. Well... I, are you telling me actually that Google wouldn't be here without what we've done? I think uh, that work is... Uh, that, those kinds of decisions obviously are very complex and they they happen over time uh, uh, because various factors are uh, at play. Um, uh, you know, companies make um, evaluate numerous uh, numerous factors when they make a decision like that. But um, uh, you know, if there wasn't a commitment to uh, you know building a creative cluster, a, a knowledge economy in the center of the city, I think that uh, it would have been. A hard sell uh, to, to to bring them here. Um, the uh, the proliferation of startups in the downtown has been a uh, uh, a completely new phenomenon, and uh, you know many of them have moved elsewhere. Some of them have moved moved elsewhere, but it's clear that uh, many of them have decided to locate uh, here and and become part of the project. Um, all right, you didn't quite make it to four, but that's okay. Uh, just 
uh, uh, earlier you were questioned about uh, the budget of, of your economic development department division. Uh, it was stated that it's about three million dollars, your annual budget? Yes. And how many people are involved in, in your department? We have um, about 26 people uh, full on a full-time basis and then a number of uh, part-timers if you include all the people at the Kitchener Market um, and, uh, and in special events. So, so how many FTEs would that be? That, that's I'm just guess, guessing now, but uh, um, it would probably be third in the low 30s. And and how many of those are really in economic development as opposed in direct economic development as opposed to uh, events committee or market or thing? Pure economic development, if there is such a thing. We, we certainly consider special events, the Kitchener Market, the uh, arts and culture portfolio to be direct economic development. Uh, we think that the success of our events portfolio, for example, results in the creation and broadening of our, um, of our brand as our identity as a city. It creates the vitality that, it, it, that um, convinces people to move here, to live here, to, to stay here, uh, to be engaged. Um, the Kitchener Market is a, uh, if you look at the, at the demographic and, uh, and the you know, many of the people that come to the Kitchener Market, um, they're active participation, participants in, in our local economy. It's considered to be a, a strong um, uh, a defining uh, contributor to the quality of life in, in our city. And it's the heart of a, uh, of a very dynamic uh, little innovation cluster in the food economy. So uh, it's creating jobs in and of itself. Um, uh, so, and of course, arts and culture, the discussion about arts and culture has, uh, has, has been uh, uh, one that we've spent a lot of time at. Um, the arts are uh, foundational. They're not only uh, an important uh, part of our economy, uh, create many, many jobs in and of itself, but they also uh, are the foundation for the identity of the city, the quality of life of the city that uh, helps to attract the, uh, the type of, uh, and retain the type of uh, worker that, um, that drives uh, the creative economy. Count your time's up, thanks. Um, I have one more person for the first time, and then I have several people who have asked to come through a second time. I just want to remind folks that uh, we had an hour set aside for this. And I also um, just want to remind people that staff are looking for input into how, um, what kinds of information we would like to get out of the, uh, uh, the work that they're doing. We're not debating today whether or not they're doing the work. This is part of their normal work plan. And so they're looking for input into the process and the things that they've outlined. So if people can focus their comments on that, that would be helpful. Uh, Councilor Marsh, you're up next. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to just echo uh, Councilor Galloway, CELOC's comments that, you know, uh, it, it'll be important for councillors to get involved and, you know, help with uh, recruiting uh, in, our, in our wards. But we also need to be careful of engagement fatigue. You know, there are going to be some usual suspects that will be, you know, easy, the, the low-hanging fruit that it will be easy to say, oh, that person's engaged, we're going to get that person involved. But um, one way we might want to, you know, just as a suggestion when you're working with the communication staff, one way we might want to um, work to avoid that would be sort of cross-marketing with some of the other engagement uh, projects that we're going to be doing this year, like the neighborhood strategy, so that people are aware that, look, this is a different conversation than about the neighborhood strategy. We want you to feel welcome to do both or choose one of them or get your buddies who haven't been engaged to, if you think they'd be more interested in this other conversation so that we can, you know, um, gain, yeah, wider, wider uh, mm -hmm. feedback. Thanks. Thanks, uh, Councillor Singh. Thank you, and um, to a point, and I'll focus on input this time around, uh, to a point that Councillor Etherington had made, you know, obviously he comes from a literary expertise, I think the point uh, across that, that I uh, was able to pick up on is we want to make sure that language is simple to understand. 
And that's not just for council, but especially for those that we're trying to engage in the community. And it's difficult to ask and pose a question until we develop and provide the necessary information as to where we're at and how we, we got here and how, will we, how we, we can continue moving forward uh, in the economic development uh, perspective. So that would be keep the language simple and ensure that there is sufficient information available in, in, for them to understand. Because again, uh, the earlier question I had asked was this is quite different from when we, it was more of a business community uh, dialogue as to now it's a general, general yeah. citizenry that we're trying to access to. And some councillors have already made comments as to the framework of how to uh, or the number of people that can be engaged or where from. I don't think there's any wrong way of doing it. This is just my perspective. Uh, I would caution and eliminate to too few of numbers. I think uh, Councillor um, uh, Ioannidis made a good point. If you access the community centers and have a larger dialogue within each ward or each community center in that, in that neighborhood that can get as many people out there. So it's a, a, a far bigger general perspective that we received from the community as opposed to limiting too few people. Um, and the last bit is uh, when focusing questions, I would hope that council will have an opportunity in, in providing input into specific questions that we could get back as well. I think this is a key pers uh, perspective out of this uh, and as well, and you already highlighted one, which is uh, more clarity from our citizens as to we have an economic development reserve fund. How do we manage it going forward? and how to replenish it further. I think that's an important question as well. But I hope that there will be more opportunity to provide input. Councillor Fernandez. Thanks. Um, <clears throat> I think it's, um, I really like the idea of the, t the thousand dinners because what it seems to me, and, we, and, and I, we've all been there, we've all been in somebody's dining room and we've tore apart the city from one, one level to another, and then there's been positives and negatives, and you know, if we had taken those discussions and one person was able to come forward and say, this is the change that we've been talking about, or this is the thing that would, bugs us the most. I think that's when you hear the real feelings of the citizens. When they come to a public engagement or they come to a stakeholder meeting, it's, it's, sometimes I think it's pie in the sky. It's not the 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 door to door, and I think Councillor Gazola mentioned it. You know the stuff that that really is critical to people. My street didn't get plowed again today. Yes, job creation is important, but I don't know if they see the city as an integral part of that job creation. Um, if this is a part of your regular work plan, I do see a few gaps, and and since we're involving in in the discussion here, then. I have mentioned in the past the empty storefronts that continue to sit in my ward, in uh, Councillor Gazola's ward, in Councillor Yunetsky's ward, um, even in Councillor Galloway Sealock's most recent addition in her ward, there are continue to be store, empty storefronts. And those are, are like missing teeth. And I think we, that there's, there's a gap there. And when people drive past these, these small neighborhood plazas and see the empty storefronts, they're wondering, well, we're, you know, we're focusing only on this area. Why are we not trying to get people to come out and, and put either a small business or a franchise or something in those, in those storefronts. Uh, I, I think we have a committed and engaged group of citizens at our advisory committees, and just inviting them to a stakeholder session that happens during the day when the majority of our advisory committee members are working, or in the case of our youth uh, advisory committee, are at school, is doing them a disservice. So I really strongly suggest that you go and meet with each one of our advisory committees. There's at least 10 members on every single one of those advisory committees from a broad cross-section of the city. There's already, by the time you add the, the ones that I've written down, um, Cycling Heritage, MAC, Kayak, Environmental Compass, there's already 70 people, at least. Um, the other thing that I was... I don't know that I, I think we should be having further discussions with business or even council because I think that there's a bias there. There's a, there's, there's a number of people who, businesses especially, and, and some of our councillors who are really, that is their, their mandate, that is their 
Um, they're driven by economic development. Uh, I think maybe we need to take a back step from, from those people who, as Councillor Marsh just said, are the low-hanging fruit. They're obviously engaged. They're, this is, this is their, their baby, so to speak. I want to hear you talking to the people who are sitting at Tim Hortons and hear, hear you talking to the people who are standing in line at the grocery store. Those are the people who are going to give you the nuts and the bolts about what they feel. And that's why I really love this idea of a, of a thousand dinners. I mean, maybe we don't do a thousand. Maybe we just put it out to each, each um, ward and say, um, if you want to have, if you're having a dinner, you're having a, a, a social gathering with your neighbors and friends. Too bad we didn't think about doing this during Super Bowl. We would have had lots of, <laughs> lots of responses at that time. And just put it out there, and and let's see what we get back. I would love to hear from my my residents um, who are gathering around coffee shops and uh, around the pool when their kids are swimming or around the, ho the hockey arenas. That's where you're going to get the real feeling of what people understand about economic development in this city. So those are my suggestions. Councillor Davey. Thank you. I'll be brief. Uh, my opening questions were aimed at, uh, I'm, I'm in the camp too, that I think the 2011 uh, document was very forward facing. I don't think we need to make significant changes. So uh, in terms of input, uh, I would really hope to see uh, more actionable items as opposed to sort of high-level policy things coming as a result of, of, the, uh, of the work that we do. Um, and that's really my only comment. I would like to see more initiatives like startup landing pad programs, that sort of thing, uh, that are going to have a real material impact on the city of Kitchener. Uh, and uh, Mr. Mayor, I, I believe uh, Mr. Gear indicated he'd like direction on this as well, so I would move that uh, staff begin uh, work on this as outlined in the report and uh, with uh, respect to uh, members of council's comments. Uh, sure, I'll take that motion in a minute. I have some comments to, uh, to make my, myself um, and I guess some things to include. The, um, I think without a doubt, um, if anybody questions um, the role that economic, can economic development can play in a municipality, one only needs to look at uh, how things have changed positively in our own community over the past uh, 10 years in terms of uh, economic growth, particularly in, in new areas and the, the numbers of jobs that have been created to know that um, there definitely is a role for cities to play in economic development. In fact, I can tell you in uh, talking with uh, the mayors that were at the Big City Mayor's Caucus last uh, week, there isn't a mayor who doesn't believe that economic development is uh, one of their and, and council's prime responsibilities for each of their cities uh, in terms of moving things forward. And in fact, the whole advocacy strategy uh, that's going to be undertaken over the coming year in regards to the federal election links um, the, the, the need for investments in infrastructure, affordable housing and transit as it relates to economic development and economic growth. For, uh, for our communities. So it always ties back um, to that. I can also say, quite frankly, without, with confidence rather, um, in the conversations I've had with Google, that without the investments and the, the decisions that we as a council have made in the past, Google wouldn't be here, quite frankly, and wouldn't be expanding and making the kind of um, space uh, investments that, that they are. From um, the point of view of the, the work that you're doing, I'd certainly um, want to make sure that as you go forward, we continue to explore um, how um, an advanced manufacturing incubator can fit into um, this work and also uh, how we continue to um, emphasize investments in manufacturing because there will always be a segment of our community that is looking for, for careers in that area, and I think it's important to, uh, to make sure that, 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 that we don't lose sight of that. I think as uh, you do your, your, uh, your consultations, I think one of the things to also consider is looking at the role that placemaking can play in strengthening the local economy. Uh, there's been a lot uh, written about that, and um, in other cities are, are doing it, so I think it's something for us to consider. I agree with the notion that we should be uh, dialoguing with all of our advisory committees and getting their input. Um, 
specifically uh, with with their lens uh, around uh, economic development. I think that uh, that would be helpful. Uh, fourthly, I, I agree with the comments around website and, and branding. Um, we only need to look at the, some of the work, for example, that Hamilton's doing recently and others around rebranding themselves to know that, you know what, we actually need to up our game a little bit uh, or we're going to fall behind. That's becoming very, very clear to me. Um, you know, Hamilton's doing a lot, Toronto's doing a lot. Just on Friday, um, Mayor Tory announced uh, a new innovation centre with 2,000 plus jobs on the waterfront. Um, and uh, so, you know, th this is this is a, a big issue, and it's a big issue for for a lot of cities. I can also say that, you know, in, in talking with uh, Mayor Tory as well as Councillor Michael Thompson, who heads up their uh, economic development committee, there's a, a real interest in, in exploring that whole tech supercluster that we've talked about in our business case for Go Transit, um, and seeing how that uh, how that works. And finally, as you look at uh, as you look at consultations, um, I think it's important that we look at um, the whole issue of of age and and work demographics. In other words, I think it's important to hear from youth. I think it's important to hear from adults who are underemployed because they can't uh, find the kinds of jobs that perhaps they once had in manufacturing. Uh, and, and so on, and making sure that uh, as, as part of our various groups that we're reaching out to, we make sure that we, we hear from those, uh, those groups. Councillor galloway Sealock. Oh, okay, that's fine. So, uh, Councillor Fernandez, you have a comment? Uh, yeah, before we take a, a, a vote on the direction, um, I'd like to have a, a sense of, of understanding from all of the comments you've heard today. Um, I, I looked at your your schedule and you had it here on the screen. Is it possible to bring that back up again? I guess I want, I want to know that, that some of the things that we've been talking about, um, you know, with regards to advisory committees, um, with regards to, you know, the should we can we consider doing something like the 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 dinners? I mean, again, maybe not a thousand dinners, but but something put, putting something out either on the website or the councillors can do it through their through their own websites, their own Facebook sites, encouraging citizens to get back to us on on that. How do we? Where can we put that in this timeline? And how can we know that that's these suggestions that you heard today will. Will be will make up part of this process. I, with respect to the uh, advisory committees, we can ask to participate in the regularly scheduled meetings in the coming months, so that we get on the agenda and have a conversation with those groups. And with respect to reaching the broader community, we're still um, considering all of our options with respect to how we can collect information. So. We are looking, for example, at a, you know, the possible use of a tool that allows people, um, almost like a forum, where you can um, contribute your idea and other people can come and vote up or vote down those ideas. And in that way, um, the more popular ideas or broadly supported ideas by the community could be elevated to, to our attention. So we're considering different ways that we can use either social media or other technologies during this time period to reach out to um, all different groups and, and individuals in our community. Just uh, to conclude your uh, to, um, response to uh, the, the, the thousand dinners, we. We were a little daunted by the thousand dinner ideas. Well, we thought uh, we, like that would require significant resources we didn't have, but um, to, to assemble because once you once you host the thousand dinners, then you have to process the information as well, right? Which is a challenge. Um, uh, what we did learn from their uh, their experience was that they put together a little toolkit that they uh, you, uh, that people who are interested in hosting those conversations were, were were able to use, and that helped to structure the conversation as well as to provide uh, a standardized feedback mechanism. So once we receive, uh, if, if council is supportive of this direction, then we'll put together a small tool that will help uh, help councillors and other stakeholders and, and uh, citizens in the community uh, to uh, to host those kinds of conversations. Okay, thank you. I think the other thing that maybe is worthwhile noting that at, at 150 conversations or dinners or whatever format they end up taking, 
um, on a per capita basis, we're actually doing 50% better than Toronto did. Um, so something to, to keep in mind. Uh, so all those in favor of uh, Councillor Davies motion? Opposed, that's carried. Councillor Galloway, Sealock. Yeah, I just wanted to um, bring up, uh, it's nothing to do specifically with this report, but um, I noticed for the first time that we have on the bottom of this report with regards to the information is available in accessible formats. And I noticed it on a couple of our um, um, reports um, in our council, and I think it's great that we're moving in this direction. However, it's not in a very good location because it looks like it's, and this is nothing, I know it's probably the, the template that you guys are using. Um, so this is overall, I guess, some feedback that I'm trying to give to the corporation um, that it looks like it's part of the report and, and I'd like to see it somewhere else and l larger print because a lot of the people who are going to, or some of the people who are going to need the accessible format aren't even going to be able to read the font size that we currently have. So I'd just like to ask staff to, to look at something different uh, moving forward in the template uh, with, with that respect. But I appreciate that it's even there to begin with. So thank you. Okay. Thank you to both of you for uh, obviously a lot of uh, really good work uh, done so far and a lot more work to, uh, to come forward. And we'll now move on to uh, customer service and uh, e-service components. And Ms. Miller, I guess you're taking that one. Welcome. Thank you. Councilor Gazzola, did you want the floor? Because you, you're having a conversation over there, so just checking. Like, did you? Okay. Okay, well, just checking. Make... No, no, I'm just. <laughs> Are you ready? Just, I'm hearing it over here, so I wasn't sure if you wanted to have a broader conversation or not. Okay, Ms. Miller. Good afternoon. Uh, Dan Murray and I are here to uh, provide a, a follow-up discussion to the Capital Budget Day discussion around uh, the various customer service and e-service requests, technology requests in the 2015 budget and how they connect to our customer service and e-service strategies. So I'm going to begin with a little bit of a refresher around the city's customer service vision and the principles and then drill down a little bit more about how those requests relate to implementing our strategy. So, uh, to begin, I just remind Council of the City's customer service vision, which is to provide a seamless customer service experience. This vision was approved by Council in 2013, along with four uh, accompanying guiding principles, which represent how we will achieve the vision. So the first one you can see is channel avail availability, meaning that customers can access municipal services our municipal staff and services through their preferred method. And so that could be in person, by telephone, by email, via Ping Street, which is, which is our app, in order to request a service, follow up on a previous request, ask a question, or register a complaint. Uh, channel integration means that the city is able to integrate customer contacts across all of our channels, so that an inquiry or service request, regardless of what channel it comes through, can be followed up from where it was last left off. So if the customer calls back to follow up to get a status update on a service request or to provide additional information, this ensures that the service request is readily available for review and updating containing any new information provided by the responsible staff person or division. The third, found, the third principle is customer interactions, which focuses on making sure that customers find it easy to interact with the city and access their municipal services. Our goal is to ensure that customers are satisfied with their first point of contact, regardless of the channel they use, as a result of streamlined and standardized process, knowledgeable and well-supported staff, and documented service levels that provide them with certainty around what they can expect in terms of response times. Finally, efficiency and effectiveness refers to cor our corporate-wide approach to customer service performance, which is monitoring, measuring, and reporting, and then utilizing that data from across the organization to identify areas for improvement and to help ensure that services are being delivered as efficiently and as effectively as possible. Some of Council will recall the diagram before you from previous reports and presentations related to the customer service strategy. Our newest councillors will, will probably not have seen this before. Um, the diagram essentially illustrates uh, how a seamless approach to customer service occurs and demonstrates the body of work 
required to achieve this vision, including the work we're doing now to acquire this, the CRM, which is the Customer Relationship Management Tool, and, and to implement our e-services and mobile, and mobile strategies. So essentially the way it works is um, that a request comes in either via our contact center or one of our e-services online. Our corporate, customer, or our corporate contact center enters the request into the system. The CRM would create a work order in the appropriate system. The work order would be dispatched to someone in the field. It would be completed in the field and the work <coughs> order would be closed. And then the system would notify the CRM to update or close the request. And finally, the customer would be updated on the status of the request through their preferred channel. With this slide, it's, it's the same slide, and I, but I'll use it to demonstrate how all of the strategies, software portals, and technology that we're talking about in the 2015 budget come together to support uh, our customer service vision. So our corporate contact center is one of the first points of our citizen contact. As you know, the contact center, which uh, became 24-7 <coughs> in March of 2014, handles about 60,000-plus 60 60, uh, calls annually. Our other first point of contact is through our online channels, including through our website and Ping Street, which is the city's first mobile app launched in July of 2014. Ping Street and the issue paper related to new public portals fit together under the umbrella of the e-services strategy. This strategy was approved by council in June of 2014 and is our roadmap for increasing channel availability and customer interactions while providing consistency of service. The CRM, which is also the subject of, of a, an issue paper for 2015, is a critical piece of technology that will enable us to efficiently and effectively deliver service to customers. It also supports the channel consistency and channel integration principles of our strategy. So no matter how a request comes in, whether it's, again, by phone, on the web, through our app, uh, the CRM creates a single source of managing, monitoring, and tracking uh, those requests through to completion. So the CRM, as you know, is a partnership with uh, Waterloo Region. It's probably the most important piece in enabling us to deliver a seamless customer service experience. It actually puts a single interface on uh, 13 different back-end work order management systems that we're currently using now. Um, additionally, we anticipate that it, would be, it will enable us, because it puts that single interface on there, to reduce uh, staff training time, since they'll only be training on one uh, system. What citizens will experience is really just better, faster, more seamless service. Finally, our mobile computing strategy, which was a council-approved strategic initiative in 2014, is what puts technology in the hands <coughs> of employees so that they can uh, receive the work orders and complete the work in the field that's uh, dispatched from the CRM. All of these components together really represent the cost of doing business and providing a seamless customer service experience that's focused on increasing customer satisfaction, improving our service delivery, quality and consistency, and delivering a comprehensive and integrated customer first approach to customer service. We anticipate that customers will experience a wide variety of, of benefits from these uh, tools, including easier access to their municipal services, greater choice in the channels that they can use, to contact us, satisfaction with their first point of contact, no matter what channel they use, uh, the ability, which we don't currently have, uh, to uh, get updates and check the status of their inquiry or service request, and a more consistent and predictable uh, level of service and, and improved staff support, meaning fewer call transfers, faster response times, and more complete responses the first time. So I'll turn it over to Dan, who's going to provide some additional information and a visual to demonstrate how all of these components could come together in, in an online experience. Good afternoon, Mayor Vermanovic and members of Council. I'll now present the uh, specific initiatives that are underway to enhance e-services and highlight the items with the budget considerations for 2015. So on this slide, we've provided a mock-up of potential e-service portal. The items on this portal and the way in which they're listed is intended to ensure that residents can easily, easily navigate the services offered. We want them to be able to find the service that they're looking for easily. They shouldn't have to understand the organization of the city and the city departments to locate that information. A major principle of the service, customer service strategy is to ensure that services are being delivered in a consistent manner across all service channels, as Jana had mentioned. 
By using the CRM as a single source of service information, we can ensure that we have a list of the various services offered and that we can deliver those services in a consistent manner. As the CRM will be a single corporate source for that information, the information will always be current, accurate, and available. The product also has a web interface that will be used as the customer-facing e-service portal. The CRM will also be used, the system used to track issues and problems reported by residents. Items such as parking complaints, potholes, tree limbs, noise complaints, etc. can be tracked in action. This will strengthen the existing reporting mechanisms in place and will allow people to track their issue and also allow the city to perform the reporting on the types of issues and where the area is affected. We also intend to integrate the CRM with the existing enterprise software systems to ensure that reported issues can flow straight through from the customer to the person actioning that work. Supporting the use of mobile technology direct to workers in the field, the CRM really is a critical piece in that seamless customer service experience that Jana described. One of the challenges within a municipality is the number of lines of business that are being operated. As a result, many of those, of those many different lines of business, we also have a number of applications to support them. Some of the systems that we have in use at the city have developed a specific web interface that allows the public to interact uh, with the system. We have already deployed a number of these in the past that make up our e-services portfolio today. In a perfect world, we would have one single product that can handle all the needs of our customers. In reality, we must mix a number of vendor-provided solutions and do our best to hide that complexity and make it all seamless to the end user. This is a reality that all municipalities our size face, and many of the municipalities are using the same software applications we are. I'll now highlight a few of those systems which make up those e-service e offerings. With the work underway to move the tax and utility billing functions off of the CIS application and into SAP, we are positioning ourselves well to offer enhanced services to customers. The SAP system will have an online self-service function that will allow customers the ability to see their tax and utility accounts online. They will be able to, able to see any current account balance, access their current and previous bills, see their consumption history, and manage their bill delivery preferences. The SAP online self-service system will introduce a new 24-7 service channel for tax and utility inquiries. It will also offer the following efficiencies. Reduction of calls to revenue staff for simple inquiries and also the potential to reduce mailing costs through the promotion and op adoption of online bill access. We have offered online program registration and facility booking for a number of years. This e-service is delivered directly from the class enterprise system and is used to manage the programs and facility bookings. The product has seen increased usage over the past number of years as neighborhood association programs have also been ad added and made available through this system. The ability to video stream and record all council and committee meetings was added in 2013. That ability is provided by a system called Granicus. Again, the complexity of that system is hidden well from the viewer, but they can quickly find and view the video recordings uh, that are available through the web interface. The concept of an e-participation platform was presented to Council in September 2014 as part of the ongoing Open Government Initiative. The use of an e-participation platform was recommended to allow electronic manner of receiving ongoing feedback from residents on current issues increasing participation, one of the three key principles of the Open Government Framework. The e-participation system will introduce the following customer service benefits. It will introduce a new electronic channel for engagement with the city and the ability to process large amount of public feedback quickly and accurately, which will allow us to improve the levels of engage engagement and seek more input on more issues of interest to the public. And I think we just heard a great example in the previous uh, presentation where input could be gathered, but the challenge is how to take that information and be able to process it. The last item on the slide we have here is the uh, Amanda Public Portal. This was launched a few years ago in a limited manner to allow people to apply for and manage building permits. The Amanda system is used for planning, engineering, building, bylaw, and business licensing. The continued enha enhancement of these services offered through this system could add a new 24-7 service channel 
for a number of services that are currently only available through counter service at City Hall. By doing so, we can reduce the time it takes to apply, get approvals and obtain permits. We can also provide the ability of a customer to track the request and approval status throughout the process without having to call into City Hall. In terms of efficiencies, this system will help reduce the number of walk-in customers, freeing up service staff for other tasks, and it'll also streamline the uh, paper-based applications, allowing for more efficient processing. Of the items that we have on the list, we've located a star, which barely shows on the screen there, but the star beside the uh, three systems that uh, do have budget impacts for 2015 and are included with the uh, uh, 2015 uh, budget uh, information. So that concludes the presentation. I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, we have a few people with questions at this point. Councillor Fernandez. Um, thank you. Um, I do have a number of questions and I'm probably going to go over my time. So while I was looking through the report, um, my first question on the uh, on page 1B-2 was how is this what we're doing now working with our current systems? Are you telling us that, no, that the, the systems we have presently are not working at all together or collaboratively? In the, uh, the uh, e-services strategy that we presented in June, uh, we highlighted a number of systems that we already have in place. A number of those are working fine. We recognize there's some uh, work that could be done to make it easier for citizens to find the way to get to those services and to be able to access them easier. So the examples on the uh, screen, uh, class is existing, the video streaming is existing, and we already have some of the uh, Amanda functionality in place. There's a number of other e-services as well. We didn't uh, try to cover them all off in this slide. Uh, we we're really focusing on the ones that had 2015 budget impacts and uh, showing a little bit of the uh, how we have different systems that to uh, to deliver e-services. Our goal here is to try and get it into a nice interface for people where it's easy to find uh, how they get access to those services. So that's why we've included a few of the existing ones in the, in the okay, list. Okay, just just for simplicity's sake, when you use the word interface. And, and often there's, there's some confusion around what that exactly means. Are you, can you give me, dummy down another word or another you know, synonym for the word interface? Um, it would be the web page that the people are accessing it on and the example that we've provided on the screen here is, is a mock-up of how we envision we could deliver on that to make it a simple, uh, simple for people to find what they're looking for um, again, without having to dig through pages on the website. So, so th does that mean a, a, a significant change to our website? Uh, not significant. Uh, we feel a number of these things we can do. The interface that we're looking at here, we're planning on using the CRM product to actually deliver it. So it's using that product to wrap it up and uh, provide it in a more uh, uh, easy way for uh, uh, our customers to find what they're looking for. Did the utilities not just do a big change and an upgrade to their website? Our utilities division, didn't they just go through a whole big restructuring of their website and information um, to try and get account information and get billing and all of that? Didn't they just go through that? I believe that's correct. Okay. That, so that, that is, just to clarify, that's a... That would be considered a microsite, correct? Okay. It's not part of the city's, it's not part of the actual city of Kitchener website. It's an actual microsite for Kitchener utilities. But my understanding from what you're describing here is that you've got utilities and taxes on here. That, we, that I mean, to me, it sounds like we're doing some duplication. What's going to happen to Ping Street now? I mean, is that, how does that fit in with what we're doing here? If I can clarify, the, uh, I think what you're referring to is the Natural Comforts website that um, Kitchener Utilities and um, Kitchener Wilmot Hydro share. Right now, Kitchener Utilities does not have the ability to force uh, customers to access their account information. There's 
marketing information and things of that nature, but that is not a capability that we currently have available. So you can't see your account? Not for Kitchener utilities? utilities customers. Okay. So maybe I could try to help clarify in, in the sense of when you're, when you're asking about, you know, what does the interface mean, I, maybe this will help. I like to think of it as creating a one-stop shop for customers, citizens, anyone to get on. It's in a single place. Everything is centralized in one place. So no matter what they would like to access, whether that be, you know, they want to participate in a community engagement campaign or, you know, they need to, to make a complaint about a pothole, whatever the case may be, they can go to one place on our web and access it. Those things will still be available in, in all the other places that they're currently available because that's part of what uh, channel availability and, and the whole integration piece is. I don't know if that helps. But. Okay, yeah, it does. Um, and I guess that, that's where my next question is. is really, I, I keep feeling like we're adding another layer and another layer. So we, we, have, we have Ping Street and, and, and we have our website and then we have our Facebook site, and we have our Twitter account, and we, I mean, some of that is engagement, and some of that is availability to access information. Some of it, you know, you're talking about um, technology, there's so many levels of technology. To me, why are we not just con continuing to go through our website and have quick and easy links to all of this stuff? I mean, we've spent the money on all of that, we've spent the time on that, I'm not understanding. Certainly. The, uh, the challenge is having the system in the back end that can actually perform those functions. What we have been doing in, uh, recently to enhance has been adding uh, web forms for people to be able to report uh, potholes and things of that nature. We haven't really built a system behind that's capturing that. We're using email. So we're lacking a lot of the reporting capability. We're lacking the uh, the guaranteed delivery of that, the passing off into the uh, enterprise system so that it can be uh, actioned immediately. We've really built some simple systems to be able to accept that, but we haven't got a lot of the pieces in the back end. So the, the particular example I gave, the CRM would be providing that functionality and tying it together in the back end. The example with Ping Street as well, that the idea would be to um, offer the same functionality that we would put through the website on a mobile device. It's another channel for people to use, but we would be leveraging the systems in the back end uh, in the same manner, whether it be mobile or whether it be web-based, uh, so that it's one system and it's really just how the person decides to access it. So how many different systems and ways or channels, whatever word you want to use, are you okay. now going to be making available to the public to make a complaint, uh, check on their utilities, register a program? How many different channels, I guess, is that, that's the word you're using? Are we now going to be... The channels are really intended to be for a service channel. So online would be considered a channel, mobile would be considered a channel, telephone and uh, counter service for that matter. Uh, when we're talking about systems in the back end, our goal is to hide the complexity of that from the people hitting the website. There are, however, a number of different uh, systems that are pl at play behind the scenes that are going to be delivering those services. Uh, I couldn't give you a number offhand. I would, uh, it, would, it would simply be an estimate at this point, but there are likely 10 plus uh, systems that are at play to provide the services. And that goes to the point of what I said for the amount of different lines of business we have. We can't possibly get one product that is going to be able to do all of that for us. Our goal is to make it simple for the customer. I guess the one, the one channel was when we, somebody called and that was the bet that was the, they called and yeah. made the complaint yeah. and it was dealt with and I know I'm out of time. You're uh, three minutes over actually. I gave you lots of extra time. Councillor Singh. Yeah, thank you for the report, because I had some questions leading up to the budget on this. Um, so further on clarity to what Councillor Fernandez's questions were. So this is a two-way portal where it's access of information but from the customer uh, and at the same time where we can respond back to them as well, right? 
So, yes, the uh, CRM would have uh, the capability to take a call. The uh, person would have a, uh, a uh, request code that they could uh, check back on the status of that. You can configure it in numerous different ways until we decide what the uh, best way for us to do it is. Uh, the details, we won't know, but most of the municipalities have uh, uh, the customer can come back, put the code in, and get a status right. request. So uh, the direction that we're leading to, where do we sit in that pact when we compare ourselves to uh, similar size municipalities or even some that may be bigger? So there are a number of municipalities um, in the GTA and across Canada who are who have already moved to this this kind of thing. Um, you know, we're certainly not first in the field, but we're not last either. So uh, I would say we're probably middle of the pack. At what stage have these technologies matured to a point? You said the, there are many different portals, so it's more seamless to the customer. There's a lot of different uh, interfaces that may be being used. Um, so where is that maturity level at, or is it the software still developing? I would say it's it's a constant evolution. Um, there's definitely um, you know, every municipality is in the same boat we are in terms of having multiple systems and trying to provide a uh, consistent um, experience through these. Um, leveraging a CRM will really make that a lot simpler. There are still going to be systems like Class which will have a little bit different feel to them, um, where it's hard to mask that it is in fact right. a different system. We can do our best in terms of um, making it look the same and making sure buttons are similar and that sort of you thing. You reference class, so we're familiar with that system. But something that's kind of more seamless that integrates everything as to what you're proposing. Prior to budget, can you please refer some examples to council so that we could refer ourselves to those websites or, you know, ourselves and see exactly Certainly. how it looks? I know you've given kind of an example of as a mock-up, but to see it in action. Uh, would probably broaden our understanding before budget. Um, the other question is, uh, you pointed out what is already systems that we already have, what is a budget impact. Can you refer to what's already built into the base budget and what is the additional uh, issue paper that coincides to the, uh, some of the stuff that's on screen right now with the stars? So there are three, three issue papers currently. Um, the the top one there being the CRM, which is a $1.1 $1 .1 million request. That's uh, built into the base budget already, though. Oh, right. Sorry. Yeah. So what's in the base budget and what's actually the additional that would be an impact above the 2.25? It's just the e-participation, right? Yeah. Yes. I think so, yeah. So part of the e-participation, e uh, there's a staff component, correct? Yes. That's, uh, that's where the 70000 comes in on top of the capital. Uh, and that, so the 60000 would be the software that we would be purchasing then? That's correct. So if we don't go ahead with uh, that issue paper, that's not to say that the access portal can't go ahead. That's not to say that we still cannot have an integrated um, customer, really, uh, you know, uh, customer access correct. point or whatever you want to call it. Use a better these terminology than I am. CRM. CRM. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Brain just went blank. So we can still have it. It just would be having a one missing link that perhaps could be added on at a later point as well. That's correct. So this is not the all, right? Like, it's not if for that, right? So, okay, perfect. That was my main question leading up as to how important is this component? And um, I think you've answered that. Thank you. Councillor Schneider. Uh, this system is obviously going to create some efficiencies. So do you see the potential uh, with these efficiencies for maybe uh, redirecting some job opportunity or job uh, functions and responsibilities so that perhaps we wouldn't need to uh, make that extra hire for e-participation? So, you know, I think the CRM will be the, the piece that creates the most efficiency in terms of what it's able to do and um, how we expedite requests and that kind of thing. It's probably too early to say, but I would say that, um, you know, as we ramp up communications uh, to the general public around how much we're doing with, with uh, sorry, customer service and the, the ways and the channels that they can access and all, all of that piece, we anticipate that the number of contacts we receive will increase and not decrease. And so, I don't, I, don't, I don't know the answer to that question yet. I think we need to get the technology in place 
and uh, before we can really understand what the level of efficiency that would be that would be created. Okay. Uh, the other thing I, I'm interested in, uh, I know that uh, at Conestoga College they have a system from Desire to Learn which uh, allows the instructors to have uh, communication with students. They can post the content of the course. They can uh, send a message out. Uh, would there be the potential, I don't know what the, it would be with the privacy laws, but you know, currently we have an issue in our ward uh, or, or there's an issue that staff have, they have to send a mailer out. Uh, would there be the potential to be able to communicate with citizens and save that cost of a mailer? There would, uh, through the e-participation tool, that's one of the functionalities of it. Okay, that is awesome to hear. The other thing is uh, the language that will be used on here. I know um, those that put together these systems and sometimes here within, in, within the institution, we speak our language. It's not necessary the language that our citizens speak. So uh, I'd like to know if there's going to be a, a you know, focus on keeping things simple for our citizens and speak their language on this system. Absolutely. I think that should always be our focus, is to make things as understandable as possible. So we do, we do strive to do that with uh, um, some of the initiatives that we do within communications. And so, yes, we would make that a, a definite focus. Okay. And, and, and with, even with the, the search function, uh, you know, I, I spoke with a citizen this morning, uh, and he said, you know, it was kind of difficult finding you on, on the website. You know, I just want to put in you know, your name or Ward 2 and be able to find it. So is this going to uh, ease the uh, search capabilities for our citizens? We are undertaking a, a website review in 2015. That's, that's a project that is on the, on the uh, business plan, and it will be part of that. We've had that feedback before, oh. and it will be part of that project. Great. Thank you so much. Councillor Etherington. Yeah, through you, Mr. Mayor, either Dan or John, uh, can you tell me, do we get hundreds or do we get many complaints about our current system? People requesting improvements? Or? Which system are you referring to? All of our computer system. If I phone into the city, any of the systems I deal with, do we get complaints about it being particularly bad? Or? I think from time to time we receive uh, complaints about the service. I don't have any statistics off the top of my head that I could share. I could, I could certainly look into that. Okay, no, I was just curious. And uh, I frequently, frequently, I run into people in my ward who don't even have computers. What would these changes do for those people? It really wouldn't change anything. I, um, just to clarify on Councillor Fernandez's earlier question around, um, you know, the methods that we, we use and how many channels are we going to have, it's really in-person, phone, website, email, social media, and mobile. Those are sort of the broad categories. They all exist currently. They would all continue to exist. If you look at customer service trends um, across Canada, uh, probably across anywhere, um, you know, people want to have uh, a greater channel availability. Channel uh, usage depends on a lot of different things. It depends on the kind of request you want to make. It depends how much time you have. It can come right down to age demographics in terms of, you know, who's more likely to use a certain channel. So we would, you know, the point is to keep them all, but just to have the back end integrated so that we're having, you know, we can, we can view across every interaction that comes in, no matter where it comes from, we can view it and track it. And my last question, and it kind of piggybacks uh, what Councillor Schneider asked, but I'd always assumed that uh, this kind of uh, new technology would result in savings in labor. But on 1B7, you actually say that in that box you say increase in 2017 and beyond for staffing and for ongoing support. I read that as more employees, is that correct? There is definitely a, a, a staffing component that's required to support this system. Um, there's, uh, within the operating budget, uh, uh, Mr. Haggy had mentioned that there was an item in there in, in the forecast to be able to support that. 
When we put the budget forward for this, we had included a two-year contract. We weren't prepared to, um, you know, suggest that there was an absolute requirement for those two people. That's what we've been told from the vendor, and it's been what the regional experience has been in implementing theirs. Uh, we wanted to see for ourselves and get the system implemented, and then um, make that determination whether it was something that was actually required or not. We wanted to be forthright and put that in there. Uh, and it was included in the operating budget as well, but it is likely that the system will require two staff to support it. But by then, Dan, it'll be too late, right? The bodies will be needed. And that's why we've included that information at this point as well. Thank you. Councillor Marsh. Thank you. Just, uh, I wonder, do we have any idea of what are the main uh, areas that people contact the contact center about right now? Do we have reports about about that? And would you be then making sure that our <clears throat> main access portal would would have all those top top ones? Is that the idea? Yeah, I, I can I can get you updated stats on what people are contacting most about. I would I know from just having spoken to them. Uh, that it is uh, roads, snow, leaves, it's those kinds of things that directly impact uh, citizens. Okay. Uh, what about events? You know, when people come to the city to visit or just people who live here and want to participate in one of the many, you know, things that happened uh, within Kitchener in terms of events, uh, do, the, do people contact the contact center about that on a regular basis? I, I would like to know. Not to my knowledge, um, the, in terms of events, the greatest uh, contact that I know that we've had in the past has been around big music fests, around parking, like when there is a specific event. Right. Um, to my knowledge, the request for event type information isn't, wouldn't rank highly. Okay, well, I mean, just a bit of feedback. I would, I would suggest that, uh, you know, just anecdotal um, feedback that I've heard is that, you know, whenever people want to go downtown or go anywhere in the city to, you know, to participate in an event, they have the, uh, a really hard time finding, first of all, information, you know, on, on the city website. But then once they do, sometimes the information is not sufficient. And I, I just would, you know, would put it out there to uh, consider on this new e-participation platform to include uh, an easier way to, for people to get to that information. Okay, thank you. Okay, Councillor galloway Sealock. Yeah, my question is uh, really specific to the parking exemption capabilities, and I, I'm looking on page two um, with respect to the second bullet there under e-services strategy, and it gives a little bit of an update about reporting um, with regards to parking complaints. But I'm just wondering, from a perspective of more of a parking exemption capabilities, is this something that we're still looking at, um, and is it something that's going to be able to be integrated into um, the work that we're talking about? Tell me if I'm wrong. Um, certainly, um, the uh, parking uh, complaints has in, has been added to the website um, and has been implemented. There is a parking systems review for the exemption component. It's a little bit more integrated into the system that's used for parking. So that work has started, uh, but it's uh, it will be a longer term uh, process to get that in place and it will come through as part of that uh, system review. So it'll be part, uh, if I understand correctly then, it'll be part of the, a system review but then can be integrated into this portal or this interface when it's ready to go and, and it'll, it'll have all the capabilities of notifying and that mobile, it'll end up on the bylaws um, dashboard or whatever that there's an exemption at that house or whatever. Exactly. Okay. The, it's critical that that be integrated so that the exemption gets to the people so they don't get a ticket. So um, it's, it's shorter, it's, it's longer term than this piece, but it, it will have the capabilities to integrate. Yes. Okay, thank you. Councillor Gazzola. I'm still confused. One of the reasons I think this came here, we, we talked about it that the operating budget and uh, it is pretty confusing as to, to me, uh, I'm sure the, uh, other minds have no problem with it. Uh, we, we have a lot, and my, my concern is we have so many things on the go and I would, I'm just, I would like to see us settle in on, on one thing or another and 
and, and move on. And it seems to me we're, we're bringing on even more new things now. I, I don't disagree with where you're going. I don't disagree with the idea uh, behind them. Uh, but the problem is we, we, we have so many facets that it's a difficult thing to do. So, for example, tell me now, how, how is Ping Street working? So Ping Street was launched in July, and uh, it's my understanding the last update I had about, I don't know, two or three weeks ago, we have about 3,700 downloads, and uh, I think about 600 of those have come just in the last few months. Uh, we've had a, a couple of hundred inquiries through it into the contact center. So it seems to be functioning really well. So is it working? So is it part of CRM? It, sorry. Yeah. It, it will be integrated in the long run. But it um, isn't now, but it's working now and it isn't integrated, so... We, as I mentioned before, we have a number of web forms that we've put in place and built in to simply send an email with those requests. We can't follow up with the, with the uh, folks. We can't report on that information real easily. So it's, we've put in some workarounds to be able to provide those services in a, uh, in a short-term manner. The intent would be to integrate. So it's not fully integrated. Is there anything that's fully integrated? Not into no. the, not in. That's the point of that. the CRM. <laughs> okay, that's part of the CRM. The CRM yeah. is what will allow us to integrate everything. everything. But the SAP is a different thing. It's a different product. It's a different product. thing. And that deals with, that deals with utilities, right? Or, or that, uh, that deals with what uh, people owe the city, right? As I mentioned, we're always going to have a number of different products behind the scenes for very specific functions. And the online self-service is not the type of product that you would put into um, a, a generic CRM. No, I, 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 but, but again, it's, now that, well, what is that system costing us? SAP. Just, just a ballpark. <laughs> 20 million. Yeah, it's just, yeah. So, but, and that's, we're working on that. That's not in place. Uh, how's the website working? The website continues to get, you know, we have uh, thousands of hits probably every week. We uh, will be doing a review, as I mentioned, in 2015 to improve any functionality. We've had some, uh, some common themes around search and, and some other things like that that we'll be looking at. I, I don't want to be critical, but there are a lot of misses too. It's it, a lot of, and I hear it around the table. People do have difficulty with our website. So yeah. That's an area that is is that is that up for fixing? That's part of our our uh, business plan. That that project is on the business plan for 2015. So yeah. yes, I, I'm to don't totally understand. You need a a, a million one for the CRM. Now, what is that? I'm missing it, aren't I? <laughs> what, what is the CRM? Yeah, what's the CRM? Uh, the, Let's the, see. The, Ping, Ping Street's going to be part of the CRM, right? So the CRM is really the, the one piece, as I mentioned, that allows us to integrate all of those other pieces, mobile, website, Everything can, so we can understand every customer interaction that happens with the city. We can monitor and track it. It doesn't matter where it comes in, if it comes off the website or from Pink Street. Mm -hmm. The CRM is really in the background and it enables us to, to uh, you know, integrate all of those pieces into one piece in the background mm -hmm. so that we can report, monitor, track things better than we've ever been able to. Mm -hmm. John, to just, to help, more comprehensive picture. just to help you, CRM is like the heap, the old help desk software, which you might remember from when you oversaw IT. Yeah, I it's know, essentially I, that for the whole city. I know. I, I've been hearing about CRM for many years, and it's, it's always coming, or it's always, but, uh, but now we're, we've got a, a, a million dollars in. How do, where does open government, where does that fit into all this? This open government action plan, which is another budget paper where, where does how does where does that is that part of crm is it part of sap is it part of what is it government um the action plan was approved last year 
and part of the three principles, the three key principles of, open of the Open Government Action Plan were accountability, transparency, and participatory government. So the uh, request for the e-participation tool fits under the participatory government principle. So does it fit in with CRM? It would be, a, as you can see right there, it would be a tool that would be in the portal and it would, yes, it would be managed uh, by the CRM. We would be able to understand what's going on on that tool. So what happens if we don't do all of these things this year and we concentrate on getting SAP up? We would not make any progress on our customer service strategy. I mean, we're, we, we've obviously got to be making progress with Ping Street. That's something we didn't have before, and now uh, it, it seems to be working. So we've made considerable progress there. There's a, a lot of progress has been made in, in building and planning around, around the Amanda. The, the, the point, I, I'm not, I guess, I know where you're trying to go, and it's you have to walk before you run. And the the point is, there's a lot of funding being requested here. When you put these all together, and when you have that SAP machine running in the background for 20 million, you know how how. Okay. I guess I'll leave it at that. That's my concerns as to. Okay. Can uh, Councillor Ioannidis. Yes, through you, Mayor Verbanovic. Just, I know this is a mock-up of the access portal here, but physically, where would we see this? Would it be on Ping Street, and would we see it on uh, our website? Like, would it be like this, or would it be a, like a, a tab? I don't want to overstep. <laughs> um, the, the vision here is to really have an e-service portal where you would enter in and, and you, you would just... be presented with these types of uh, icons uh, organized in a way that means something to our customers. Okay. And uh, so you could use that same layout and terminology and, you know, the visual aspect of it, whether it be on a mobile device or a web. Okay. My other question is, and, and you don't have to answer this today, but back in the day when everything was telephone communications, how fast did things change to go towards the computer? If you can somehow quantify that, because I think that's important for here, because communication devices changed throughout our lifetime. Like there was the telegraph, there was the telephone, and then there's the, the, the PC, and now everything's going towards the cloud. So I think, that, I think we need to get a better understanding of where technology is going. And... Uh, to me, from what I heard from residents when I knocked on the door, you can never have enough modes of communication. I've had residents say, uh, in particular, uh, like for KW Hydro, we had we had a quite of, you know, we had an issue there because we Hydro didn't have a Twitter account, so there was there was a lot of folks there that were up in arms that they weren't on Twitter. So I mean, I I, I personally think the phone. I bet you if we looked at our phone statistics, they're going down instead of going up on how many phone calls we're receiving. So I think that needs to be quantified and. Uh, if I could, um, just related to your comments about the telephone, um, I've done some work with the Institute for Citizen-Centered Service, mm -hmm. and they have a, a survey that they do annually with a number of dis different municipalities that uh, participate in it and benchmark their customer service with their citizens. And the last survey done, which was just this past year, um, indicates that telephone uh, has long been the most important, like the most uh, popular. Uh, it is going down, and it's right now about on par with web. So. Okay. And I think that's similar with other technologies. Like I know with TV, TV used to be the prime source of media. Now it's all online. So, I mean, times are changing. We have those old strategies, but we need to adapt pretty well much. And uh, I, the way I look at this is this is a complete suite of services, and... CRMs, our CPU, and everything else is like software <laughs> towards it. In your in your terms, Dan, is that is that correct? It it is a key piece to be able to pull everything together and um, really to be able to track 
what people have requested, where that request is, and be able to feed that back to them. Provide reporting to the organization on how well we're delivering those services, um, and really to be able to make sure that everyone's delivering it the same way. And one other aspect, with, with the e-participation, are we able to gather analytics with it? We gather all the information that we need to know about whoever's communicating with us? So there's a number of functions that are, the participation is a fairly new area. Um, we have not gotten so far into that yet that we would know the specific functions. We, uh, uh, Yuri Conga had presented the uh, uh, capabilities and we had done a little bit of uh, uh, research on what sort of products are available. I think we would have to um, define exactly what it is we're looking for and uh, before we purchase the software for that. Okay. Um, there's a number of features that would be of interest, but that work hadn't gotten uh, quite far enough to uh, write an RFP, for instance. Okay. And if, if I, just a little quick comment is, I think I, when I recall through our embryonic study, I think e-participation was one of the items that was important to our residents. So okay. I think it's important that you look at that perspective. Okay. Uh, I now have uh, five people that want to speak a second time. Um, just people keep. You haven't spoken yet. Sorry, Councillor Davy. Go ahead. Uh, thank you for the presentation. I thought the refresher was useful. Just um, I think two questions. I just want to make sure when this is all in place that whether people are reporting, got to pick something like potholes, whether it's mobile, web, or calling in, everything will go into the same database. So essentially then in terms of open government, there'll be a whole host of new sets, data sets that we should be able to start releasing with the flip of a switch or close. Yes, uh, the intent is that the CRM would capture all of those uh, requests. Okay. And yes, it could be used as an open data set too in the future. Okay, very good. And um, just wanted to be 100% clear on the ping street. The intention is once the system is in place that like there'll be, I'm sure staff will go through and see what the most reported items are, but whatever the generally, the most, um, I guess I'll say complaint items will be included in the Ping Street application as well. Yes, so there's actually a number of potential options for how Ping Street can be integrated um, with this. Um, the version that we would end up being deploying uh, based on our timing has some uh, fairly uh, mobile friendly capabilities in it. Uh, so really we may even be able to take the exact same screen that we would put on our website and make it available on the, uh, the mobile device. Okay, but the, the intention then would be, so you know the standard complaints are you know potholes, uh, sidewalk wasn't shoveled, grass isn't cut it's supposed to be, trees, limbs are too low, all of that eventually the goal is to have that included on the mobile side as well. Correct, it would be identical in both places. Excellent, thank you. Okay, Councillor Fernandez. Okay, um, I'm, I'm gonna be going sort of backwards a little bit. Uh, just going back to the question from Councillor Etherington about the additional staffing. Um, my under, is it my understanding and Council's understanding that on top of the additional staff person for the e-participation, you see an additional two staff being added to complete the whole um, the project two, or more? My uh, the two staff are for the uh, CRM implementation, mm -hmm. which is really what makes up a, a large um, amount of the implementation cost for that product. Um, those are, it, it's a, con a two year contract um, for the two staff to be able to work on and implement that product. And then in the future, we do anticipate that those staff will be required. Um, the vendor has suggested that those two staff positions would be required as well as the regional uh, experience has shown us that they've uh, also experienced that. So we have included it as a forecast item in the 2017 operating budget. Okay, so, so essentially three uh, for, the, for the CRM and the e-participation this year, and then an additional two or three it, by 2017. Oh, my apologies, no, it would not be additional in 2017. It would be making those contracts permanent. 
Okay. Should we determine that's the right way forward at that point? Okay. Um, you know, we've just talked a little bit about um, savings and efficiencies, and, and that was where I was going with those questions. But um, is this technology going to be integrated enough with everything else that we're not going to be seeing in a year or two another add-on, another add-on, another add-on? Because my concern is that we continue to to add more and more applications, if you want to call them, more and more, um, I, I don't even know what to call, <laughs> to call this, but, but is that what we're going to see? That would certainly be our hope. Um, there's always going to be a number of different software applications. As I mentioned, the number of specific pieces of software we use, um, there's going to be others there. What we want to do is, with the CRM, for instance, uh, when a complaint is or a complaint or a request comes in, that that will in fact pass it over. Um, if it's a pothole or a tree down, it would go to our City Works application and automatically kick off what's required to work in there. So the goal is that the contact center staff are using one application, and other service staff are using one application, and they're not going into multiple uh, different applications to be able to. Uh, support customer service. So nobody's really going to be doing their own thing. I mean, Amanda is one one program. Another one, you know, is SAP. Another one is CityWorks. Another, but CRM is going to be the overarching program, I guess, for lack of a better word, that will let's call it the grandfather. That's going to did, um, point out or or. or sort of organize everything else. Is that, would that be a, a really simplistic, basic <laughs> understanding? Uh, I'm a technical guy, so it's really hard for I me. know. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I think in, in the sense that you're, you're speaking, yes, that'll be, the, that'll be what customers see, and that's what people providing customer service will be using. The other products will be behind the scenes. Okay, and I guess one last question because I'm probably going to go over my time again if I don't shut up. Um, <laughs> where does the uh, um, stuff like Open Door and this plasticity thing that I've just been hearing about, I mean, is that not a duplication? I mean, it's, it's, the intention is uh, people putting input on comments and suggestions. How is, the, how is that not duplicating efforts? So and that's what worries, sorry to interrupt, Jenna, but okay. is that going to work, is that what we're going to see about some of this? So those two initiatives in particular are uh, employee facing. They're internal to the organization. They don't face citizens. Um, uh, I'm sorry, Plasticity and Open Door. Those, uh, Open Door, for example, is on our intranet, which is our internal facing, um, you know, communications tool for, for employees. Uh, you, you could potentially see some of that kind of functionality if we introduced an e-participation tool. That's where, you know, if we have a forum like that, where we would have um, the opportunity for citizens to go on. And, and as, uh, as the KEDS presentation mentioned, they wanted to have a forum where people could go on and, you know, uh, share ideas and vote them up or vote them down. That is a functionality of an e-participation tool. Okay. Thank you. Councillor Singh. Yeah, I'll be very brief. Um, I, I see here a common thread of questions being asked of, you know, the cost and the, um, you know, additional staffing requirement to implement this type of program. But the other question is, which I'm not really hearing, is the cost if we don't do this. So we probably already have the data set of the number of inquiries you receive, permits, uh, interaction with the planning staff, as well as reporting for various issues throughout the whole city. If, as we, if you continue to meet the, uh, the growth projections as we go along, uh, what type of staffing component would be required if you don't have this type of uh, system in place and it requires a person-to-person uh, -person contact? If you don't have that information, is it quantifiable? Is it easy enough? Or is it just easy enough to say that it's going to cost or need a lot more people than the number of jobs to implement this program or this software? I, I think the cost would probably be substantial. but. You know, it, it's not so much in terms of, of physical bodies, but, you know, open government and all of these initiatives, customer service strategy, are all 
um, you know, citizen facing and all have a tremendous impact on sort of the, the level of trust and, and, and confidence that citizens have in their government. Customer service, good customer service is uh, like in the top two or three drivers of, of why people trust their government and have confidence in it. And okay, so a quick focus on that. Yeah, a than quick just focus on the customer service when it comes to reporting a problem. This type of interface will allow that person who's reporting it receive an email or contact back as to that it was completed and the time frame that it took it to complete that. Would that be the case? Yes. That's great. Okay, thank you. Councillor Marsh. Yeah, um, we'll, I, I assume that privacy, you know, uh, will be a definite consideration when, you know, yeah. right. So um, that said, will there be an opportunity for people who want to stay in touch and want to receive notifications when there's a new, uh, you know, engagement opportunity um, to be notified through their email? Can they create a username and, and do it that way? That would be the functionality of the e-participation tool. Right, and so so that's... That's not going to be something in addition to what we're doing. That's what we're looking at right. for this tool. Right. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Councillor Etherington. Through you, Mr. Mayor, just a very quick comment. Um, I've asked my questions. Uh, so my comment, uh, while I always support improving customer service, I, at the moment, I'm undecided. I question spending this kind of money, not because I'm a techie Luddite, which I undoubtedly am, but because of spending budget priorities. And in my opinion, we're in the process of rejecting, or we will be rejecting or reducing much smaller amounts of money for what I consider higher priority items to this one. And I could give you a list of those. I won't take the time to do that now, but uh, that's where I'm coming from. Okay, just uh, in terms of my own uh, comments, first of all, thanks uh, for the, the presentation. I think it was helpful to see how, um, and to remind folks how some of the systems that you're talking about um, are interconnected and interrelated with each other. I think, you know, if if we all acknowledge that citizen-focused service delivery is why we're here, then the kinds of things that we're, we're talking about are key in order to be able to, to do the job that we need to do and deliver the services that we need to deliver to our citizens. Um, you know, when I started working here as a, as, as a student many years ago, there was barely a, a PC in the organization. Um, we essentially had a bunch of dumb terminals around the organization that gave you some key information about pieces of property and so on. And then we started introdu introducing PCs and lo and behold, WordPerfect was our word processing system and Lotus123, uh, if I remember, was the, uh, the um, spreadsheet at the time and DBase was, uh, was the database. And as new versions of software came out, and, and people became more used to the Microsoft uh, family of, of software products, that became the technology that we used. And we've, we've changed technology just like the world is changing. I mean, when I started on council, the BlackBerry didn't exist. Now in many communities, you know, fortunately people are still using the BlackBerry, but in, in the private sector, unfortunately, some have decided to use other uh, uh, hardware tools. But the reality is that we're living in a technological world and we need to make these investments if we're going to deliver the services that we need. I think all of us uh, from, from a customer service point of view have, have talked about uh, you know, how frustrated we get at times when citizens call in about snow removal or potholes or, or whatever and can't get the information uh, back we, we don't know, you know when things need to be escalated from a, a staff person to a manager to a director so that we know things are in fact being done. Um, you know, we know that citizens can't get the, the response back be either via email or whatever to know that their, their issue is being uh, dealt with. These are the kinds of um, tools that are going to be available through this integrated mix of, of software that we're, that we're talking about. Um, you know, a, a CRM is, is basically a, a giant database that allows us to track all those interactions so that we can make 
uh, and, and management can make better decisions. It's all about um, you know, having that information so that you can then start making decisions based on the kind of uh, information you're gathering and the feedback uh, that you're, you're hearing from people. Um, you know, fr from, from my perspective, these are very important investments because they're as much about both customer service as they are about future cost avoidance as well, if not the potential for some savings as, as well. So, um, you know, I, I would hope that we give this serious consideration at budget time. Um, if we don't, I think the other thing we need to keep in mind, and, and I would ask at budget day that staff remind us of this, is what are the, the lost opportunity costs? I know, for example, in the case of CRM, we're getting addition, we're saving dollars uh, by going ahead right now and partnering with the regional project. If we don't do that, it's going to cost us more in the future to do something like that. So I think we need to keep that in mind as well. So with that, I think uh, people's questions have been answered. No motion is necessary. Uh, thank you very much for uh, an informative presentation. Um, motion to go into camera. Moved by Councillor um, Schneider, seconded by Councillor Fernandez. All those in favor? Opposed? That's carried. Uh, and I don't need three readings. So with that, motion to adjourn. Councillor Marsh, Councillor Ioannidis, all those in favor, opposed, that's carried.